Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to give you a talk about a Renault infotainment system uh, with live services. So the first question to my mind is why am I here standing about, uh, talking about this? So I submitted a talk. And it wasn't about this, it was about Unicode. So I said, well, I'd like to give a talk about Unicode, C++, that kind of stuff. And they said, yes, we'd love to have you on as a speaker. That's good. Yay, acceptance email. And then somebody said, well, would you like to do another talk? <laughs> okay, big swallow. About what then? Well, something TomTom, -tom, because we need some actual industry experience. We'd like to know about how things actually go. Uh, it has to be technical. It can't just be a sales pitch. So expect not much sales pitch. And it has to be a balance between what I can tell you and what my NDA says I can't tell you. So that brings me to a question. Uh, I'm talking about TomTom. -tom. It's a company I work for, but who here hasn't heard of it? Wow. So when you look at TomTom, -tom, you think about this. Did anybody have a different thing in mind with TomTom? -tom? Nobody in the, in the room. OK, because TomTom -tom wasn't a company making these things. They actually started out as a company making a computer game for um, PDAs, which actually looked like this. <laughs> so here's the announcement for V-Rally by TomTom. TomTom have done it again. So yes, this is the second version. The first one was black and white. <laughs> so this is what we had. And then at some point, they looked at this, and they figured, well, making games for PDAs is not making a lot of money. Most people with PDAs are company type, and they might be able to do more with them if they knew where to go. So let's make an app for that on the PDA, which doesn't have GPS. So how do you do navigation without GPS? We'll just give you a list of things to go to and follow. So we made a route planner Europe. The date is the same, but that's just a, a backdating issue. The, the time frame is right. So this one gives you a list of things and then gives you a button to push to go to the next instruction. If you ever make a mistake while driving, well, tough. It can do recalculation, but you better park the car because it's not going to be fast. It's a PDA. It's 2001. So then they figured out, well, people have this. What about adding software support for GPS receivers? So then it can keep track of it and do everything automatic. And that took a giant flight. So as you can see, the note says you can even attach a GPS receiver, allowing you to see your exact location on the map. Wow, it's almost the future. <laughs> so they figured, we'll take this, and instead of telling people buy a PDA and then attach a GPS receiver and clunk it up in your car, put everything in there, we'll just sell it as a box. So they took a giant box and put everything in with a tiny screen, because 2001. It takes a time. So you get this device. It's about two and a half inches across. It's about six centimeters deep, so it's pretty much a cube. Was that running Palm OS then? That was not running Palm OS, but it was running something related to it. Okay. So this is way back. And this may be the first one that you've actually seen. Came with a circular mount at the bottom because it's huge. And then we figured out, well, actually, we can remove a whole lot of space if we make the screen a bit bigger, because then you get a lot more space in the width. So we made this one, which is only like three, three and a half centimeters thick. And then we went to this one, which is the one I got when I joined TomTom. Tom. So this one is a bit more modern. It has navigation. It actually has online traffic. This is a 2009 model, 2008, I think. So that's fairly new. It comes with built-in data reception, even though my phone didn't have that yet. Mm -hmm. And did you get touch? Did you have touch from the first one? Well, this one already had touch. Okay. That's implied, yes. So Palm had touch before that. Yeah. yeah, so the PDAs, the very first ones, had touch. They also had uh, cursor controls at the bottom. And as soon as we had this one, you don't actually have any other buttons, so you have to make it touch. So this is the first one. It had four buttons on screen. And for this one, we had the typical TomTom -tom design of having three buttons wide and two buttons high. Didn't include a screenshot of that. I, maybe I should have. So then time carries on, we get to more modern designs. So we go from this 2D view with essentially whatever we had to a more fancy view. So we have lane guidance. We can tell you we are, you're on a three lane road and two lanes are going left. And then we get to the newest versions, which have completely runtime generated diagrams. 
So this is a static picture that we pre-generated. This one is runtime rendered by the device with the actual buildings on the site that you would, you would expect. Okay, so we have TomTom. -tom. So which device we're going to talk about? So this is a list of the devices that were in my list of options, starting from the Philips Karen system, which is historically very interesting, all the way up to the unannounced company with unannounced product, <laughs> which I cannot tell you about more. So I figured. <laughs> so I figured. Well, let's see what we what we can cross off the list. Well, first off, the Philips Karen system. I have a video of it from the 80s. So yes, there was car navigation in the 80s. It cost more than your car. So that's kind of old legacy. Then there's video dating. It's also predating TomTom -tom time. So let's not talk about those. Um, so what about the unreleased Peugeot device and the unannounced company with unannounced product? Well, I'd love to tell you a lot about those because those are really interesting products, but I can't even tell you the name. So, no, let's, let's cross that off the list. Then we have the current generation Peugeot, the Renault Arlink 2, which is the stuff that you can buy in the store right now. It's the current generation of devices. So I'd love to tell you a lot, but everything I tell you will help anybody else hack into the device. So I don't think that's a good idea. That's going to be an NDA problem. So that leaves me with two devices. So when I was asked about when, what the talk was going to be about, I said I'm going to do about the Carminat, which is the slightly older one. And while making the talk, I figured that actually most of the stuff I remember and most of the interesting stuff is about the R-Link. So I said, well, sorry, but it's going to be about the other one. So last minute switch is going to be about R-Link. So what is an R-Link device? Well, it's this one. So this is built into a Reno. <coughs> It's navigation, multimedia, all sorts of things around it, steering wheel controls, the usual thing you would get about eight years ago. And you would expect to see this in a typical car of eight years ago, so Renault Clio, or a Megane, or an Espace, or pretty much most of the Renaults from that time. So what is it? Well, it's a connected navigation system. It has an internet uplink, it can download traffic, it can download uh, other information, weather information, fuel, parking, online POI. So if somebody somewhere sets up a pop-up restaurant, you can get that live stream to your device. It's Android-based. And that's a thing. Because Android in 2010 era is not great. In fact, it's almost the first of the few releases that were public about Android. And we're talking about Gingerbread 2.3, which means that it doesn't target tablets yet. It doesn't have an understanding of anything but a phone. And this is not a phone. So we have issues there. So everything before this was an embedded Linux system. The Carminet was embedded Linux. This is Android. It's not going to work the way we did before. It's a 2.3 Android. And the C++ support, as far as it existed, was basically C support. And the C support itself wasn't great because instead of using a standard C++ and C library, they used a thing called Bionic, which is sort of most of C, but not even entirely. So the C++ support is, ve is very far from complete. So we are sort of in trouble because we have C++ source code. And we have a lot of it. So we got to move all of that C++ source code to Android. Somehow. It doesn't have RTTI, it doesn't have a dynamic cost. Let's see how, how bad that is in a moment. And we don't have a platform SCL because SCL is a C++ library and we don't get that. You can link with SCL port. Maybe that works. So first let's move it to Android. We start by having Android 2.3. There is an NDK, a native developer kit. That's better than I was expecting, but it doesn't do a whole lot of C++ support. There is a variant that somebody uh, uploaded online. I couldn't find the name anymore because it's 10 years ago and trying to find any kind of documentation from 10 years ago is nearly impossible. There was a version of the C++ compiler that somebody created with full RTTI support with a standard library, which is completely unsupported by anybody and everything. So do we want to go there and use this instead of the op official one? Um, well, we are trying to release a professional product. We don't know what this compiler does, and we cannot really review the entire compiler. So let's not go for that and go for the supported one, and then see how bad that is. Okay. 
So we have no RTTI, we have no dynamic cast. How bad is that? Okay, grab over the source code. How many dynamic costs do we have? 127. Could be worse. Could be worse. It could be better as well. So 127. Okay. How many of these are actually useless? So how many of these are across a virtual interface? Because that makes it even more complicated. None. Whew. Okay. Seems tractable. So how many are actually an upcast? Or a cast to the same class? About 100. But if you're doing an upcast, and just for people who don't have in their mind how an upcast works, you have a pointer to a derived type, a type derived from a base class, second type derived from base class, and you cast your pointer to the derived to a pointer to base. Well, there's only one way to go, so your compiler can do this at compile time, and in fact can do this without a cast at all. Okay, so that's easy. We just take out the cast, recompile everything, check, check everything, it works. Not on the target yet, but on the other platforms that we have. So, we have 100. We got rid of those. How many do a checkable downcast? So that's the opposite of an upcast. Well, 22. It's almost there. So downcast is we have a pointer to base. We want to get to the derived type. We need to check which one it is before we do a downcast because the static cast that we will be replacing the dynamic cast with will always succeed, except it will just give us undefined behavior. We don't want that. So in these cases, we add some kind of enum to base, make all the derives, put that enum value in base, and when we try to do a dynamic cast to the derive type, we check if the enum is correct. And if so, we allow it. If not, we give a null pointer. Close enough. It's kind of horrible, but it'll work. So we go to derive pointer. It's valid, or it's a null pointer. That works. So, anybody doing math has figured out that we've missed five. So we have five left. So there's a thing you can do with a dynamic cost that I didn't know you could do until I reviewed this, which is a cross cost. And all five of these are cross cost. And four of them do that with a known class at the bottom, i.e. we know the actual implementation type. So in that case, it's easy. We have the implementation, it derives from two base classes, and somebody's trying to cast from base two to base one, which means there needs to be some kind of odd pointer arithmetic. We can't just replace it with a static cast, unless we first downcast it to the actual type and upcast it to the correct type, or add a function to the actual type to cast to the first base. So we add a function to the actual type, implement it there, interface in base two to cast to base one, call that, get the base one pointer back, implement it in actual type, everything is fine. Except for one. Because one of these is not a crosscast in a known hierarchy. It is a crosscast in which we don't know the actual type. We cannot know it because it's compiler generated. We have a source code generating compiler that generates these. And we don't know the base one class to cast to because it's also generated. So this is Kind of horrible. In this case, we just went on to modify the entire compiler to try to do the other thing that we did before and just hope everything comes out completely because we now we're hacking the compiler and we didn't want to. Okay, we got lucky. So we can now convert that pointer to a base pointer. Okay, all dynamic costs were gone. Most because they weren't useful. Five because we just had to sort of break it out. So blunt force. So then we got to the STL. What Phil. Exceptions then that also depend on RTTI? The exceptions depend on RTTI in so far that the compiler can generate it. So what they did was uh, they turned off the RTTI and exception support in the compiler. And they didn't implement any of the runtime support. You can turn on the RTTI and exception support and they didn't hack it out of the compiler so that worked fine. But the runtime support is not present which means that we can do RTTI by turning it back on. We can do exceptions by turning it back on. We cannot do dynamic costs because we don't have the support. And I think at that point we didn't have enough exceptions in the code base that that was an issue. So effectively, it works, except that we still don't have an STL. And a whole lot of code is actually using the STL. So okay, we take STL port, which everybody at the time knew was a good STL variant. 
except that the last time it was actually useful for most people was around 2000. So it was implemented to whatever you needed in 2000. Anything beyond that wasn't tested, wasn't functional. There are bug fixes. We need to go and look at whatever it's doing, fix things. In some cases, we actually find out that the SCL port is not the problem, but we are, because we're relying on some details that happen to be the same in Clang and in GCC and in Visual Studio, but different in SCL port. So sometimes everything compiles, everything compiles fine with all of the SCLs, except in this one case it does something different. Memory leaks, corruption, lovely. So we go through all the code, find out all of those locations. Uh, one thing in particular I remember is that we had some code that relied on the iterator type not being a raw pointer, as in we tried to modify it as a R value and SCL port just gives you a pointer which is not usable as such. So that didn't compile. Okay, we have SCL port. So our code is now on the device. And it starts up. But that doesn't mean it works. Because we still have PND code, basically. We assume that we have a battery, it's emptying slowly. By the time you get an empty battery warning, you sync your file system, you prepare for shutdown, everything's gonna be fine. On automotive, we don't have this because A, we're forbidden to have a battery because of safety reasons. If the fire department comes to your crashed car and tries to cut into something, they want to know where the batteries are, take them out and then know that everything else doesn't have batteries. So we're not allowed to have a battery. <laughs> and we have an engine that will just draw all the power, giving everything else a brownout. Which means that we have to be really careful about our file system. It's going to be corrupted at random because somebody just turned the engine on or off or pulled a key. That's a, a challenge. And then there's a second problem, which is that we want to update our device. Wait, we have new maps. What does PND stand for, sorry? Uh, PND, sorry, I forgot that. Uh, PND is a portable navigation device. Oh, all right. Good call to call it out. So everything is still set up for the portable navigation device. Um, you can ask a user to go pick it up, put it next to your computer, connect the cable to it, download an update. I can expect you to put it there for two hours or overnight and leave it there. So then we put this in a car. I can't tell you to go take your car, drive it up to the eighth floor of your apartment building, <laughs> put it next to your computer and leave it there overnight. It just doesn't work. And then you get into the problem that if a P&D breaks, a user takes it, goes back to the store and says, my P&D is broken. And the store says, oh, that's bad. Here, have a new one to loan while we fix this one. That's fine. If your car breaks, that doesn't work anymore because the dealers don't like to give you a new car while they fix the old navigation system in the car when the entire car is working fine. So for warranty as well, it's also much simpler. You just give them a new one, replace it, fix it, whatever. All of those things are a much bigger problem now that we're in automotive. So we had to do a whole lot of hardening. We did a whole lot of investigation into in particular SD cards and found out that a bunch of those actually aren't suitable for automotive. As in, they do random block reallocations, which works fine in, automotive or in consumer devices, but if you do it in automotive, you will get random block corruptions every time you start the engine. Which means that if you take one of those, put it in your device, the map is gonna be fine, everything's gonna load fine, and by the time you get to Switzerland, it's gonna be corrupt. So, we basically had to source our own SD cards, sell those to dealers to sell to customers for use with the device because the other ones will work for the first few times, but don't count on it. And then we get to the last one. Everything is still set up for just PNDs, and a PND has a GPS device. It's a nice thing, it gives you a global position, but it gives you a position with some accuracy. It doesn't give you a direction. It doesn't even tell you where you're going. It just waits until you're moving far enough and then it says, well, apparently you're pointing in that direction because you just moved in that direction. Try it with your Google Maps. When you try walking backwards for 100 meters in a city, it's gonna point you the wrong way. But on cars, we know, we know so much more because we don't just have GPS. We have a really good GPS. It's more accurate than this because we have a, like a four meter antenna. We can be better. You can't put a four meter antenna on a portable device. And we have different things. We have a steering wheel. We have wheels. We can get the information that they send out about wheels rotating and about the steering wheel being turned to our device. So we can integrate that into positioning. And then we know where you are. 
we also know if you're inside a mountain and there is no GPS reception possible, it's just technically inaccurate, uh, impossible, we can still know where you are. We know what way you're going. We know how fast you're going. We know when you're taking an exit inside a mountain, inside a park parking garage. We can do a whole lot more than the portable devices could do. And then we get to one further part that is making this project a whole lot more complicated, which is that as much as we'd like to say we didn't have electrical vehicles, then we actually did. Except we couldn't tell anybody. We had this thing in our parking garage, which is an electrical vehicle from 2010 era, and we had it in 2008. So when Tesla was basically just releasing their very first EV and selling two a day globally, we had this thing in the garage. And they didn't just have this one. We had the Zoe, which is the first one, the Fluence, the second one, and the Twizy, the third one. Yes, that looks a bit weird. <laughs> I know that. So the first two are basically replacement automotives. They have a certain range. It's not a great range, but first EV, so what do you want? Um, the uh, Zoe had a range of a couple hundred kilometers. The Fluence had a similar range. And the idea that they had back then was not to charge them, unlike the one you see there. The idea was that you would take your car to a battery replacement station, drop out the entire battery, move it out, take a new one, move it in, drive off. I.e., I can charge my car faster than I can fill it up with petrol. That's a great idea. There were uh, hundreds of stations built for it, and then the entire idea flopped and everything went bad. So that's why you don't see that anymore, and that's why the Fluence is actually a really cheap car to buy secondhand, because the system that was made for it doesn't actually quite work anymore. So anyway, the first two I know are guaranteed to have the system. The Twizy, I don't think, has this. So this was more of a scooter, basically. But it's fully electric. It qualifies as a car, so you can take it on the highway, but it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> you should go find one if you can. They're, they're cute. So at this point, we have the Roadster from Tesla being sold at about two cars a day, maybe slightly less. And the Model S didn't exist until 2012. So you get all the problems with having an EV. So we need to add EV support. They don't use fuel like a car does, which means that if you have a normal car, you're starting uh, at the top of a hill and you're rolling down, you're not using any fuel, but you're not building up anything. If I'm in an EV and I'm standing at the top with a full battery, I could have regenerated that power, but now I can't because my battery is full. And vice versa, if I'm at the bottom driving up, I have to spend a whole lot of power. And I could maybe regenerate it, so battery level management is important, and not just keeping it always full. Then we have EV-only POIs, which is the stuff like charging stations. Which of those have the cable that I have? And remember, this is early EV, so having the right char charging cable is not a given. We just have to hope that they have 12 different charging cables, and maybe they have the right one. And if not, you can hope that you have a backup with a regular 220 volt connection. Otherwise, you're just going to be stuck. And most importantly, we don't have an engine starting or stopping. So those notifications that we had for when you can do certain things, when we pop up certain screens, they just don't exist. There is no engine starting. And the best way to fix this is to write the code to fix it, figure out how to handle all these things, and then test it. So how do you test an EV? It's not really easy. You should get one. So we, we tell Renault, we need an EV for testing. Well, that's fine. We can get you a Zoe. Can we get two? No. <laughs> um, OK, that's less practical. OK, so we integrate our system, drive it around. OK, it seems to be working fine. How do we charge it? Um, Reno, what about the Zoe? How do you do charging? Well, we haven't actually announced that we have a Zoe. So could you just put it in the garage, please, and not tell people? Keep it silent. And we don't have a charger. Not that we just don't have one, we haven't designed a charger. We have an experimental one that people started together in Paris. We can't give you that one because we have only one. So um, don't, don't test too much, please. Because you don't have enough range to get to Paris and if it ever runs out, you're just gonna be stuck. Yeah, so. We have an EV support, we have the device for testing, now we need to get an update on it. 
So we start with updates. We have a PND device, portable device. We hook it up to a computer. It has a live connection to the internet. It can use TLS. Everything's fine. I have a car. I can't tell you to put it next to your computer. Because most people don't have a computer next to their car. And even if you were to force people to put the computer in the corner of their house, that would still be very inconvenient and very rude to expect that. Especially for people living in apartments who can't physically do that. So maybe we can do it on 3G or 2G, because we didn't have 4G or 5G or whatever comes next. Well, one, we don't actually have deployments for that yet. So it would be 2G speed, so about one kilobyte per second for a multi-gigabyte map. It's a bad idea. And even if we did, the prices would match. If you look at a price right now for a data traffic subscription that can transfer like five gigs a month, you're probably paying 20 euros. So that would be increasing the price of a car by 20 euros a month, or like 2,000 euros for a 500 euro navigation device. I don't think we can sell that. So we need to fix this. We need to take this out and replace it with something else that we can use. So what do we expect from our update system? It needs to be secure equivalent to what a typical user would have. So if I'm a typical user, it should be as secure as the system that I had otherwise. So the portable device on TLS, I want it to work about as good as that. So I don't want anybody be, to be able to hack into it. I don't want my uh, personal locations leaked. I want my map to arrive on the device safely, securely, nothing modified. And if something goes wrong, the SD card is corrupt, should that happen? I get a message saying, hey, your SD card is corrupt, please go back to your, uh, to your computer, instead of being in a car with a corrupt map and tough out of luck. So we kind of want to make this a single round trip. We have a user, they may be parked 10 minutes from their car. I want them to go home in the evening, take their SD card along, put it in the computer, do something. Next morning they wake up, they go back to the car and drive off and they should have new software. In this case, we don't just have a round trip to a server, we have a physical round trip to a car every time we want to send some information. So if we can make this work in a single round trip, we have to make that happen because it's just rude not to. If we need more than one, we need a really good reason why we need more than one. We have to guard it against intentional and accidental replay. So for example, I have a device that has a map I install it, I make a copy of the SD card that has the install instructions, I refund it, and then I install it again. Well, that's intentional. Somebody's just trying to take the map and not pay for it. But also the accidental case. I download an update, my wife downloads an update, the same update. We put mine in the, SD, uh, in the car, and then the next day my wife comes along, puts her SD card in. We accidentally had a replay of the same update that might corrupt the system. So we want to prevent that from happening. We have to make sure that we are okay with packet loss. And again, in this case, packet loss means that you're walking from your car to your home and losing the SD card along the way. <laughs> or maybe you had your SD card al along and some, somebody decided to put some photos on it instead of you know, the update that it had. So for all of these bits, we have to make sure that everything is recoverable. Otherwise, you would be stuck with a car that doesn't work. And it has to be all of that and secure after a factory reset, which is required to erase everything we know about, your, about you on your device. So even after you wipe the device and put in the SD card that had the install instructions for your map, it still has to not work somehow. So um, I'm not going to go into the full detail of this because two reasons. One, this would take three hours, and two, I will be breaking my NDA. So we are going to go into a high-level overview, which I've considered taking out and didn't. So Fingers crossed. So your device writes a passport on the SD card that basically identifies it to, your, to the online system. You take it to the computer, update program runs, sees the passport, uses it to write an update to your SD card signed for your target device. The device receives it, updates its passport. That basically works. Next time around, we come around, we have the updated passport, we know what's going on. If we see the blank passport, it's probably been factory reset. So this system works. We can do an update. There's just one really big problem here. When we say we write to the SD card, 
were routing to a FAT32 file system. And about 10 years ago, there was a really big company getting sued by Microsoft because we wrote to a FAT file system. So now we have to make this all work without writing to the SD card. Yeah. OK, so when we say we write to an SD card, we still have a FAT32 patent. We don't have the license to do this, and we basically really don't want to pay for all of that because retroactively, millions of dollars. Bad idea. So we cannot write to FAT. We can't write a long file name. We can't update anything because that would mean reading long file names, so violating patents. So we can't really do anything. We don't have an easy workaround. We've tried a few things, like just overriding things, and then Windows says if the SD card is corrupt, so terrible user experience, and it's also breaking things. And we can't even partition the SD card. So we thought about that. What if we just split it in half, put the first part in FAT, second part in X2, <coughs> make the second part for the device, the first part for Windows, and have the device copy from the SD card without reading long file names to the second part? Well, that's good, except that my map is 6 to 10 gigs. So we need a 32 gigabyte SD card to hold a 10 gigabyte map. And at the time when a 16 gigabyte SD card is like 150 euros and a 32 gigabyte SD card is like 400, yeah, no, no, no. We can't do that. It's too expensive. Even though right now you look at it like, yeah, sure. It wasn't possible. So we have to find something else. So number one, we create a small overlay file. And we just pre-allocate some amount of size to it. We give it a delta to the underlying file system. So basically make it a copy on write kind of system. We don't touch the system below it unless you first sync whatever's in there to the file system. The overlay cannot be more than four gigs because FAT doesn't allow that. You can't have a file bigger than that. It's a really complicated setup. If ever, anybody ever forgets to sync it, it goes out of sync. It's just going to break horribly. And that means that our Windows computer has to basically keep two file systems sort of in sync, writing stuff from one side to the other. The device has to read from one side right to the other. It's a giant mess. So I figured, well, we can do better. So at this time, I, and I will tell you more about this in my second talk tomorrow, I am sort of a yak shaver. I do things that are tangentially related to the thing I set out to do. So at some point, I set out to make a hobby operating system. And I wrote my own X2 driver. So I figured, well, I've got an X2 driver. I could probably port this to Windows, write a small shell on top of it, mount something beneath it. So we'll did, we did that. Take the X2 driver, port it to Windows, create a shell on it, put a VFS layer on, top, on the bottom. That gives me access to all the parts at the bottom. So we take a whole lot of big blobs, two gigabytes each, concatenate them, pretend that's a file system, so sort of loopback mount that and use that. And this triggered a few people thinking, well, actually, at that point, we're not writing to FAT anymore. We're just writing to the files that happen to be visible in FAT, but we're actually writing to a different file system that is not patented. So that actually could work. And it has bigger advantages. It's actually really good. So we make the overlay the whole SD card. We just take the entire 16 gigs, mount X2 on that, or X3 and get journaling. We have a custom block device. So we read the FAT table to figure out how these things are laid out, compile that into a list of extents, i.e. start here, this many blocks. And if we create the file system, that's just going to be start here, entire disk. It has no overhead because we just have a block device mapping transparently to the other one with an offset. So we get X3 on our SD cards and still comply to the, fat, to the SD card spec and still get it usable on Windows. We just have to tell the people for the update application, they have to port a file system driver in their application now, and they have to do their own file system, reading and writing X2 directly, and everybody else just sees a whole bunch of binary blobs. And it is fine if you move files around. We'll just get a more fragmented view of your, of your SD card. So it's going to be slower, but nothing's going to brick it. It's actually kind of stable. We don't have a synchronization step, so we don't take your delta from your device and then sync it and unless somebody changed something in between. It's just going to keep working. There is no sync, so you can't get out of sync. We can be more reliable than FAT32 was, which means that RSD cards are going to be more reliable than the stuff they're based on. 
That's awesome. And we get rid of pattern problems. So we're there. We have working software. We have positioning that's more accurate than your PND would be. We have software updates. It works, it's secure, we don't have patent violations. We've tested it on all the cars that we need to support, and we have the EVs that are actually released on time with support. There we go. So let's take a look at the future, because I'm pretty sure that everybody's heard news about TomTom. Tom. We have a P&D market. We sell those devices. People don't buy them. At least people do still buy them, but it's every, every year it's going to be less people buying them. People don't want them anymore because they have phones that can do the same thing. They have an in-dash navigation that can do the same thing. Yes, this is us competing with ourselves, sort of. Um, we tried to uh, broad, uh, broaden our view on the consumer market, so we made a sports watch, we made an uh, action camera. Tried to sell these, tried to become a big name in those environments. The first one succeeded mostly, except that we didn't become the biggest name which basically in that field means you're not good enough and you're just going to lose money until you are. And at some point we decided this is not going to work. We are not a running company. We are not a company that does this. We're a navigation company. So we kind of stopped that. We stopped making Bandit. It's a TomTom -tom Bandit, by the way. Did, did that have GPS or what? What's the, I don't understand the market. Why the action camera? That's a really good point. You don't understand why? I don't understand either. Okay. <laughs> I'm just showing it to show that we did diversify okay. and we tried different things. I think it does have GPS. I would hope. And it has a few different tricks to make it really easy to edit movies that you just shot while going down a ski slope and then uploading it online, but okay. it kind of feels weird. So that didn't work. And if you watch the news recently, there was a really big sale at the start of this year where one giant part of the company got sold to Bridgestone. It's called Telematics. So I got a question from my mom about this, saying, well, they just bought a giant part of the company. Are you going somewhere else? Are you working for a different company now? No, no. So what is telematics? So you have the part of TomTom -tom that does routing, navigation, traffic. It's not that. You have the part that makes the consumer devices. It's not that. You have the part that makes automotive integration. It's not that. You have the part that makes online APIs where we can sell this to any kind of people. It's not that either. So then my mom looked at me like, then what is it? What do they do? Well, if you are a giant company, say UPS, and you have 100 trucks that need to deliver 1,000 packages in a city, or 10,000, and you would like to save fuel, then uh, they have the solution that allows you to do that i.e. in this city we can only take right turns because they're faster and left turns are really expensive or forbidden in some places. Uh, we want people to have all the packages in a sort of optimal order. We want to make sure that all the packages get delivered, that nobody has a too long road, uh, that maybe we can just schedule one driver less and save money. So that's what that part does. But at the same time, that's just using routing and navigation. It's not making it. So it's sort of separate from the rest of what TomTom -tom does. So it's a big choice to sell a part of the company, but I pretty much agree with it. So then what do we do? We're not making P&Ds, we're not making consumer devices, we're not doing this anymore. We do make this. And this is an image that blew my mind the first time I saw it, because somebody told me, we drive a car along a highway and we take an image of what's on the side, the depth of it. So that results in a basically flat image along a road. And I was like, that's not going to work, that's not going to look, look good, not going to look realistic. And then they took that into a movie and exploded it out. And then suddenly, you're looking at this like, that's a ridge, a mountain ridge. Here's a, land, a lamppost, there's one, there's one. I can just see what's on the map and exactly everything that's there just by looking at this. So if I'm an automated car, I can look, see if I have a match with the things I'm supposed to be detecting around me with what's on the map, and I can really accurately position. I can position on lane precision, and even better, I, can, I think they got up to centimeter accuracy in terms of where you are on the road. So they can give you a warning based on positioning alone that you're getting out of your lane, which is kind of nice if you have an automated car. So that's what that's for. And we also bought Autonomous which is a giant uh, German Berlin-based startup for autonomous driving. 
they also have their own cars. I'm not sure exactly what they do, and if I was aware of what they were doing, I wouldn't be able to tell you. <laughs> but we are going into autonomous driving a lot. And this is really, really up-to-date news as well. If you look at the date, that's this morning. <laughs> so this stuff is in the news this morning as we woke up. So this is not old stuff I'm telling you. This is actually new stuff, and this is the stuff that's currently on the news as news. Um, then we also do automotive. We have a giant contract with Volkswagen Group, and Volkswagen is Audi, Lamborghini, Bentley, Skoda, Volkswagen, Porsche, in many countries, including Japan and China. We have a contract with BMW, which is, if you're keeping track, there was a second really big company called Here, which was bought by a conglomerate of companies, uh, automotive companies from Germany, among which Audi and BMW. And for these two, we already have part of what they, uh, they were hoping to get out of it. And we have a Peugeot, which has TomTom -tom traffic. So these are the parts I can show you easily. There are more automotive contracts. I don't know which ones are public yet, which is the reason I can only show you the things that I can find myself on Google. So if you go on Google, you could probably find 100 more. I am afraid of telling you more about these because I don't know which ones are public. But we also do something else. We have APIs. So you can go there and get your own free API key. This is developer.tomtom.com. And you can get access to the APIs that we use ourselves. So we have maps, we have routing, and we have search. So you can look up location or multiple, plan routes from A to B, display them on your own maps. In as much detail or as little detail as you like, in whatever format you like. And then we have the bigger stuff that's coming up. And I try to tell you as much as I could about this. I've asked the people responsible, and I can't tell you their names. And they told me I can't tell you anything else either. <laughs> so this is basically what I can tell you. We do awesome things, but I can't tell you what. So we are hiring, <laughs> but I can't tell you for what. So we, we have online APIs, automated driving, automated integration. Uh, autonomous driving, and we have some unannounced things that I'd love to tell you, but I can't. So that is Simulated pretty much. Stuff. Hmm? Simulated stuff. I can't say yes or no to that. <laughs> so that is basically what I wanted to tell you. <laughs>